Okay, I'd like to have a session、um, in English because a lot of you are studying or spending time in the West, and it's a common complaint that people are unable to explain to friends or even teachers overseas、um, about Buddhism. You know, somebody asks a question and you don't feel capable of answering, or else you don't know the right words. And so sometimes it's a matter of knowledge. Sometimes it's a matter of language. So I'll, I'll I'll just start and say a few words first, and then if there's any questions, then we can ask something.、Um, In in Thailand and in the Buddhist countries of Southeast Asia,、um, particularly、uh, which follow this school of Buddhism, which we call Theravada Buddhism,、um, Buddhism is a very、um, unified,、um, homogenous um, uh, religion. When you go to the West,、um, you find something quite different,、um, because Buddhism is, for the most part, an imported religion、uh, or tradition.、Uh, you, you'll notice that many、um, Americans or Westerners are, are, are not too comfortable even with using the word religion. Or even calling themselves Buddhist. So、um, there have been、um, surveys. I think I've seen where they ask them,、um, "Are you Buddhist?" And maybe、um, I, I can't remember the figures now. Maybe say one percent of Australian population said they were Buddhist. But then, if you change the question and ask them, "How many of you?" Have studied Buddhism or practiced Buddhist meditation, then it shoots up to five, five percent or six percent. Just those people not don't really feel that they want to give themselves a label、um, as Buddhist, which you know is obviously not a problem、um, in this country. Now, in in Thailand,、um, Buddhist, I mean you know Buddhist history. In Thailand,、um, started around the time of King Asoka, which is a hundred or so years after the Buddha passed away, and、um, in the time of what called the Dwarawati civilization or Suvarnabhumi, which wasn't yet an airport but was the name of a,、<laughs> um, a whole area of Southeast Asia. So in Thailand, we think Suvarnabhumi was basically in Thailand, and in Burma, they think it was basically in Burma, and this kind of argument goes on. But that was the kind of the first wave of Buddhist missionary、um, activity, if you like,、um, coming over from India to the Burmese coast, and then moving inland, and then.、Um, Following that, we, we saw the rise of the、uh, Angkor Wat civilization in Cambodia, and Angkor was、um, originally Hindu, again、um, imported from India through merchants and commercial activity to begin with.、Um, towards the end of the Angkor period. Um, the kings of Angkor adopted Mahayana Buddhism, and as most of Isa and most of northeast Thailand, and going up as far as、um, Sukhothai, were all part of the Angkor Empire at that time. There was an influence of Mahayana Buddhism in Thailand. Also,、um, some of you may have been to Burma, to Pukam, and seen all the huge number of chedis there.、Um, and um, this Pukam 
was built at a time when Theravada Buddhism was flourishing and there was an influence from Pugam that came into Thailand. But um, all these um, forms of Buddhism were um, superseded um, with the um, rising of the first Thai state in Sukhothai. Now, at the time when Sukhothai was established, the, the center for Theravada Buddhism, really the uh, flourishing center of the whole tradition, was in Sri Lanka. And many monks from different parts of Asia would all travel to Sri Lanka and ordain there and train there before returning to their own countries. And one particular group of monks um, trained in Sri Lanka, in the forest monastery of Sri Lanka, um, had established um, a very respected monastery near Nakonsi Tamarat. So when the uh, Sukhothai state was established, um, the king um, sent representatives to invite the monks from Nakonsi Tamarat to come uh, and live in Sukhothai. And then the, um, so that was the form of Buddhism that became like the um, national Thai Buddhism, if you like, um, originating um, in Sri Lanka, crossing from Sri Lanka in Nakonsi Tamarat, and then established in Sukhothai. And the other forms of Buddhism gradually kind of faded away. Um, over the course of hundreds of years or periods of progress and decline and at regular intervals monks from Thailand would go to Sri Lanka and get some training and come back and establish you know, like a new tradition. So up in the north you, you may have come across monasteries called Wat Padang and there, there was a whole group of those which were all um, built and established um, as a result of Thai monks going to Sri Lanka in the, I don't know, 14th, 15th century or so. Things um, turned around, so by the, um, um, before Grung Siutia was destroyed, um, Sri Lankan Buddhism declined and monks from Ayutthaya were invited to go to Sri Lanka and revive the Buddhist order in Sri Lanka. So one of the Nikai in Sri Lanka is called Siam Nikai um, because it was established by monks who came from Thailand. So, um, of course, after the destruction of Ayutthaya, everything was um, in complete confusion because the Burmese wanted to destroy not only the city of Ayutthaya but the whole culture and they wanted to prevent it from ever becoming um, a competitor um, in the very lucrative trade between China and India and, and so on through to the West. So all the um, manuscripts and all the cultural artifacts, everything uh, was destroyed and of course this had um, a great effect on the uh, on the Sangha, on the monastic order as well. Um, in the time of um, Rama the first, then um, he made great efforts to revive the monastic order and did a um, made a did a great many different things to um, try to remedy the situation and he was quite successful in that. But still by the time of um, Rama the Fourth, Rajaganti C, um, then the monastic order wasn't in a very good um, state and uh, Rajaganti C, before he became king, he was a monk for many years and he was very dissatisfied with the 
um, sta- the status of the monastic order. So he established his own order. We called it Tamayut Nikai, uh, which is a kind of like a reform order, which stressed going back to the texts, um, eliminating um, what he saw as the superstitions, um, trying to create a new form of Buddhism which was both conservative and at the same time so-called scientific uh, enough to um, be accepted and respected by um, the Western powers that were threatening Thailand at that time. Probably know in the mid-19th century then Britain and France were like, eating up the whole of the this part of the world, Britain had already um, taken over India, it was in Malaysia or Malaya um, and Burma was starting to fall under its influence, Sri Lanka of course, the French were in uh, what's now Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos so Thailand was like a buffer state in between and so um, there was also this kind of pressure to create a state which would be um, respected by the West. And um, so, uh, as you know, there are two orders in the, in the uh, Thai monastic um, system, the Tamyut and the Mahanikai. Um, really, all Mahanikai means is, um, originally meant was all the monks that were not Tamyut. Um, so it wasn't like a like a you didn't have a structure or an organisation because in every, those days everything was was very spread out and there wasn't any real sort of central authority. So all the monks that weren't Tamayuk called Mahanikai. Um, I, I won't go in. I don't know anybody's really very in, disinterested, but just to make the point that um, the different that we, we have a real difficulty talking about um, different religions because of vocabulary and it's it's easy for us to misunderstand. So if we talk about Catholics and Protestants, we tend to use this word Nikai or Nikaya. Um, Or if we talk about Sunni and Shia in uh, Islam, we say they're Nikai. Then when you talk about Tamyut Nikai and Mahanikai, um, you, you can be um, confused and start to think that it's on the same level, it's the same kind of thing. Whereas, in fact, it's just a very minor matter of um, Sangha organization. But um, there's no difference in terms of doctrine um, or understanding of teachings of Buddha, the Buddha. So... Buddhism in in Thailand, to go back to an earlier point, Buddhism in Thailand um, is uh, um, a great unifying force um, in this country. Um, You probably know in in America, for instance, that um, they had to um, make a... uh, Yes, it's part of the constitution, and it's what they call separation of church and state which means you're, you're not allowed to teach religion in schools, public schools in America. One of the reasons is because there are just so many different Nikai, apart from the Catholic and Protestant, the Protestant sects, I think number 70 or 80, um, and they all have different opinions um, and different beliefs, and they very rarely agree with each other. So it's impossible to teach something called Christianity in schools because there are so many different versions of it and there's so much, so little agreement as to what the teachings of Christianity are. So you can imagine if you tried to teach that in a public school system, you'd have chaos. Whereas Theravada Buddhism um, in Thailand, which uh, the figures are something like 90-95%, um, it's a very different kind of religion to start with because it doesn't um, put that kind of emphasis on believing in things that um, the religions that grew up in the Middle East do. Um, 
but it's also one in which there is no fundamental disagreement um, as to what the teachings are. It's just some people know them and some people don't know them, but there's not any uh, real disagreement amongst people uh, who have studied the teachings. And this is um, uh, one reason why Thailand has a real advantage over many other countries if it hasn't really made use of that advantage. Um, People are not really um, aware enough of these kinds of uh, issues um, to make much use of them. But if you compare Thailand, say, with Malaysia, where you have something like 60% Islam, 30-40% Chinese, uh, mostly Buddhist, and then a smaller number of Christians and Hindus, then um, religion is a divisive force in Malaysia. It's an obstacle um, in many cases, whereas in Thailand... Um, Buddhism can be um, definitely a very great support for this country. Now, having spoken about the um, unity, homogeneity, and this sort of the one um, clear understanding Theravada Buddhism, if you go to the West, you find that um, there are so many different schools of Buddhism. And the particular form of Buddhism that we all follow, the Theravada Buddhism, is uh, really in the minority in the West. The most popular forms of Buddhism are the Tibetan Buddhism. Um, And that's for a number of reasons. One, historical, that um, so many of the Tibetan monks had to leave Tibet after the Chinese invasion in the 1950s. Um, The Buddhists in the West um, are two main groups. You have the um, what they call the ethnic Buddhists and then the the American Buddhists if you like. I I don't think that's quite the right word but the ethnic Buddhists would be people who um, have originally come from Buddhist countries, um, immigrants from Japan, um, after they've established themselves, particularly in um, California, they invited monks to come from Japan and build temples, Japanese Buddhist temples for them there. Uh, Chinese came, again, mostly in in, on the west coast and built Chinese Buddhist temples and invited Chinese monks to come. And then uh, in later years, uh, Thais, Burmese, Lao, Cambodians, all uh, emigrating to the States and wanting to build their own temples. And so the temples, uh, Buddhist temples in those countries, have strong um, cultural um, role to play and people feel that the temples are the centre in which they can maintain their culture so their role as uh, in terms of teaching um, Buddhism and um, Buddhist study and practice is often quite small and and it's often just a or, or in some cases even more like a social club for um, the, say the Thais or the Laos or the Cambodians in that particular area. As far as the, um, say the, the Americans go, then um, many interest in, in Buddhism really began um, in, well it began in, in Europe much earlier, again as a result of the colonial system and many British um, civil servants coming out to this part of the world and studying and translating texts. And um, before that even, in the 18th century, the, um, there was great interest in the academic world in the West in Sanskrit, which was believed to be like the mother language. They believed all the languages in, of 
from Europe and Asia all came from Sanskrit. So there's great interest in in studying Sanskrit and translating Sanskrit texts. Um, then the um, Western culture in general um, suffered um, some incredible setbacks in the 20th century, most particularly the First and the Second World War. Um, and the First and Second World War led many thinking people in the West to question their whole culture, their religious tradition, uh, their value system. Um, for instance, Germany, um, which was considered the most advanced culture in Europe, whether in terms of science, art, literature, and so on, um, became the birthplace of the Nazis. So people said, well, look, something's going wrong here. You know, we're, um, maybe we're going the wrong way. So many people became interested in um, Asian religions, particularly after the Second World War, many Americans in Japan and so on. And then in the 60s and 70s, then was the time of uh, the hippies and many uh, young people from the West coming to Asia looking for adventure and interested in um, Indian religions, and many of them becoming monks and studying for a long time in um, Hindu, Buddhist um, ashrams and monasteries, and then going back and establishing tradition in the West. So you have a lot of uh, Westerners whose main interest is in meditation and often don't want to have anything to do with the trappings. So if you go to meditation centers, often they won't, they won't have a Buddha, for instance. They don't want to have any, what they see as like Asian extras. They just want the real thing, meditation. But then it often becomes quite dry and um, narrow that way. So this is a background to the so many different kinds of Buddhism that you can find. And it's difficult for um, to teach because, for instance, the monks, you may know monks in Japan, um, they're married and uh, they drink sake, you see. So if you're in a group of American Buddhists and you, and you say you shouldn't drink alcohol, then they're going to get angry, like, like you're criticizing their teacher, you see. Um, and so you have to be very careful what you say and there are many different opinions about it um, as far as language goes um, there are one or two points first of all th the language of Theravada Buddhism is Pali now you notice I pronounce that as Pali rather than Bali and, and that's because um, the Pali language has no alphabet of its own and so each um, in each country they write the Pali words with their own alphabet and over the course of time there have been, been different um, traditions about how you write these words down and what they sound like so in the um, in the west we use the Roman characters with, and I think that the pronunciation is pretty um, uh, is pretty much the same as you find in India and Sri Lanka. And now, in that system, um, what would be a J um, is not pronounced in uh, is not written in Thai as you might think as Georgian, but as Georgian. So, my name in 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 Thai Pali is Chayasaro with a Chochang. But if it's written in Roman, in English, it's Jayasaro with a J. So this can be confused, just a small thing, if you're speaking with Westerners and then you know, about Buddhism and then they, they use some Buddhist word, sometimes you can't quite understand because, simply because they pronounce it in a different way. And it's not that um, they're right, you're wrong, you're wrong, they're right. It's a different convention. So, um, jaw and chaw, um, they change. Um, the other one is 
uh, D and T. So, you know, we're all practicing here and in the trees and everywhere around, they're all the Tevada, okay, Ma'anu Motana, yeah? um, But in, in a Western language, you don't say Tevada, you say Devata. The T and the D switch. So from Tevada, it's a Devata, you see. So the J and the Ch switch and the T and the D switch and the G and the K switch. Um, so I can't think of an example now for a word with a oh um, gum. We say we say gum or gamma. Yes, and in the, in the West you'd say kamma. Uh, now what's what complicates it even more is that in the West, many of the technical terms that they use are, come from the Sanskrit rather than the Pali. So um, when the Buddha taught, Sanskrit was the language of the Brahmins. It was kind of the posh academic language. And in fact, people of other castes weren't allowed to study Sanskrit. You could get tortured and killed if you tried to learn Sanskrit, um, if you were not a Brahmin. And the Buddha said that he didn't want to teach in that special language, which only a very few people could understand. So he used the normal everyday language. Um, it's, it's a bit of, this is a bit of a simplification, but basically this is what we call Bali. So it, you can, one way of comparing it perhaps would just say that um, Pali is to Sanskrit like Italian is to Latin, something like that. But many of the Buddhist words in, in, that are used in English um, are derived from the Sanskrit. So the, the Pali word is gamma, which in Thai we shorten and say gam, gamdi. Uh, Gamchua. In in the West, they use the Sanskrit karma, the karma, karma. But that make that special, making that special sound with the r, um, it's not very easy for Westerners. So they say karma. So when you hear someone say karma, what that means is gum, and it's exactly the same word, but it's just being pronounced differently. There are also um, I, I, I'm sure you all, all know this already. If I'm, you know, why are there so many s- saw sounds in Thai? Saw sua, saw rasi, saw kai tamai. When when we go and jump in, no. มีใครทราบมั้ยว่าทําไมมันต้องมีลายสอไม่มีใครรู้เหรอเอ่อคือเทคนิคเอ่อสอสอรสีอ่าสอควายเป็นอ่าสออินพอร์ตอินพอร์
อย่างเช่นพระเจ้าของฮินดูสีวะสีวะมันเป็นมันมีตัวเออยู่ด้วยแต่บางทีเขียนเป็นภาษาอังกฤษจะเป็น S H I V A เขาเรียกว่าชีวะแต่คนไทยเอาเอาแต่สอนเรียกว่าชีวะแต่ก็ตัวอักษรจะบอกว่ามาจากไหนอย่างไรในเรื่องการแปลนั่นมาจะเป็นภาษาไทยไม่ใช่ภาษาอังกฤษอังกฤษ translating translating um, words from Buddhism into English um, I don't myself I don't think it's a good idea to use Christian words because um, the concept is not the same, and you can often misunderstand. Um, I mean, even I mean, sometimes you see Bangkok Post and uh, you see monks uh, suat mon, and they say monks praying. You see, and suat mon isn't praying. Praying, ก็คือหมายถึงว่าคนไปออนวอนพระเจ้าแต่We, for s u t m o n we use the word chanting to chant. b e n g t i p r a k called it a priest. p r a k not a priest. Priest, ก็มักจะมีภรรยาแล้วก็มันจะเป็นผู้ที่ทำพิธีทางศาสนาคริสต์มันมันไม่เหมือนกันแล้วบาปเจ้าก็เรียกว่าสินบาปกับสินก็ไม่เหมือนกันนั้น we have to be very careful when when talking um, you know about these things not to use words that uh, confuse things more than clarify them so that's a that's a few things I wanted to say about talking about Buddhism does anybody have any anything they'd like to ask or anything they like to say yes Well, um, part of the problem is that the word religion itself um, is quite recent, quite recent origin, and because the you know the major academics um, in later years have all been in the West, and it's been the West and non-Buddhists who have defined what religion is. So. If you look in any dictionary, you know religion is always a matter of uh, some belief in God or gods. And so people say, "Well, what's Buddhism? You know, you, who's your God? What's your gods?" And or often people say, "Oh, you're a Buddhist. You know, what do you believe in?" That's like the first question. And the underlying um, thought or understanding is that. Religions are belief systems. They're all they're all basically the same thing. So Christians believe in Jesus, and Muslims believe in Allah. You're a Buddhist. What do you believe in? You believe in Buddha. Is that right? And, um, but it's it's important to um, recognize a very important point that um, the religions that grew up in the Middle East. Um, Judaism, Christianity, Islam—they are one group of religions, or why I call them a family of religions. And this family of religions—you'll notice these days in the West—they're not using the word religion so much anymore. They use the word faith instead. So these days, people don't say Christian religion, Islamic religion. They say Christian faith, Islamic faith. They talk about faith communities and so on. And and that in itself points out that for that that particular family of religions, faith is the main point. It's the it's the defining factor in a religion. It's a belief system. 
So you become a Christian by adopting certain beliefs. You say, do you believe this? You say, yeah, I believe that. Okay, you can be a Christian. Um, and similarly with Islam and, and Judaism. So um, when we come to religions that grew up in India, and in particular Buddhism, you come across a completely different thing. It, it's, it's not that kind of religion at all. Um, and I call it a, an education system rather than a belief system. So that's the first point you have to make clear. It's not, it's not a belief system, it's an education system. And um, Buddhism uh, considers that the uh, basic religious duty or um, the function of religion um, is to provide a path or a training or an education by which human beings are able to eradicate all suffering um, and to find true happiness in life. And that's based on the view, or there are beliefs there, of course, and it's the belief that human beings are capable of doing that, that you can um, abandon evil, do good, purify your mind. Um, so if um, I guess if somebody says to you, you know, well, what's Buddhism all about and it's say, like, well uh, Buddhism is an education so it's a way of, it teaches you um, how to abandon evil, do good and purify your mind it's like a very sort of simple basic um, and Buddhism teaches that there is um, liberation from all suffering um, which anyone can realize if they follow the path of education, training that the Buddha laid down. Yes, I, I, that's an interesting argument. And I, I mean, they, um, you know, you probably read and studied um, theses which, which argue that you know, ruling powers make use of religion, religious structures in order to legitimize their, the power that they have and the status quo and so on. There, there, I mean, there is an um, element to that. What, one point I'm trying to make is that um, I, I object to this um, idea that there is this thing called religion and religions and that Buddhism gets, gets joined in with all this and, and I find that many of the um, the criticisms that are made um, are valid criticisms for the belief system kind of religion but they're not valid for Buddhism and I think that because um, Buddhists themselves have not studied Buddhism enough and have just believed the propaganda in the West and have not actually gone into it in a very scientific or studied the primary texts studied and practiced it they haven't realized just how radically different Buddhism is from these religions in the West. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I think that Buddhism has a great deal to offer the world. I think um, also, you know, there is a the whole question of what does it mean to say that, uh, you know, such and such a country is a Christian country or that's a Muslim country or this is a Buddhist country. What, what do we really mean when we say that? I mean, how does it manifest in how people live their lives? I mean, if you're going to go by textbook standard, um, you know, you say, well, a Buddhist society is one in which people keep five precepts. But I mean, how many people in Thailand keep five precepts? I mean, what percentage? Uh, I mean, very small percentage. So, you know, how, how much does Buddhism... Um, Play, role of, does it play in people's lives? I'm not talking about the ceremonial side of things and the, the external, but the, in terms of the, the practice, the educational, the transformational um, process which the, the Buddha was teaching. Um, as far as uh, economic um, activity as um, an indicator of progress, then I think that's also very problematic um, in the sense that 
in 200 years since the Industrial Revolution has taken place, we have managed to arrive in a situation where um, it's unlikely that human race is going to survive more, more than the next 100 years unless something r- drastic changes. So seen from that perspective, you could say the Industrial Revolution is probably one of the most disastrous things that ever happened. Um, in terms of... But if assuming that economic activity, economic progress is, is basically uh, good, um, it, it's also worth... Um, looking at the growing amount of evidence um, which shows that the whole of Western um, uh, industrial revolution and the technology it was based on uh, almost all came from China and that history um, has been very what called Eurocentric. It's been written by Europeans and with the idea of uh, this kind of gradual progress leading to Western culture as being the sort of the, you know, the final um, development. And, you know, even a few years ago, some American, as it's like the end of history, you know, this is it, we've done it. Um, But now they're they're finding out more and more that until for like a few thousand years, until around 1800, um, China was the, the major power in the world. And China, the eclipse of China and decline of China is maybe 200 years out of thousands of years. And now China is coming back to where it was before. So it, that in itself, um, I think, is um, uh, an argument against this, this idea of um, you know, some kind of connection um, between religion and, and progress. But I think that if it's the kind of progress which which we've seen in the West based on um, ideas that human beings are the masters of the world and human beings have a right to um, destroy whatever they like for their own, uh, for their own short-term benefits and that um, greed is um, a good, greed is good and that, you know, the more you get, the better and... Um, then these kinds of ideas have been poisonous ideas. And I think that in, in some cases, um, uh, religions have done less than they might do to restrain those kinds of ideas. I think coming back to the China, yeah. um, if, you, if you look at it, it's not the technology that they lack, that they mm. make the product mm. but it was the expertise in management and to promote the product. That's why this Yeah, well, I mean, there, there are, you know, this is a big uh, subject, but if you read, um, uh, there's a very interesting book by a professor in America called Jared Diamond, uh, which is, um, and his book, Guns, Germs, and Steel, goes into the geographical causes of progress, e- economic progress, and the fact that how, um, how, how, how much a country runs from west to east, the amount of... Um, the, and the amount of crops that grow in particular areas, and uh, yeah, this I won't go into all of this, but um, there are all kinds of causes and conditions um, which have not really been taken into account before. And geographical um, reasons can be uh, much stronger than have previously been thought. England is a kind of very small country, um, and it's hardly any mountains. It's an island. Um, and communication is just so easy um, whereas say Thailand until uh, 50, 100 years ago was thick forest and very difficult to get around so just practical reasons like this rather than cultural or religious reasons I think can often uh, have more effect on how things uh, develop in the country mm. Yeah, I don't know whether there's, you know... um, Yeah, um, well, again, another very big subject. As you probably know, in the Buddhist time, there were both male and female monastics, bhikkhu and bhikkhuni. And after about a thousand years, which is not a short time, the the bhikkhuni order um, disappeared. 
and um, we made the, the, the mail order. Um, by the time Buddhism came to Southeast Asia, the, uh, the Bhikkhuni order had already disappeared. So we don't have this kind of memory of this kind of golden age in Thailand where there were um, male and female monastics, um, which is you know, a, an obstacle in some case. Now there are um, technical um, reasons in the, uh, in the vinaya, it's like the, uh, the code of discipline, um, which make it very difficult um, for that order to be revived. Now, the people who are in favor of reviving that order have their arguments, and, and some of them are quite, quite good arguments, but basically it's still not, in Thailand at least, um, it's not um, generally um, accepted, and I don't think there's a great um, call for it outside of a um, small group of academics, people in, in Bangkok. And if you go out, out, once you're out of Bangkok, then uh, I don't find any great interest in it. But uh, that's uh, you know, not quite the point. I do feel that there, um, it would be useful and um, correct to create uh, a female monastic order I just don't think that the revival of the old one is the, the right way to go about it. The Mechi order, um, I don't think, is, could really be developed enough, and it's, it, people just don't have the kind of faith in it. Um, in England and in uh, monasteries of Ajahn Chah in, 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 uh, in the West, they've developed a new kind of order which um, adopts many of the rules of the bhikkhuni but and they're not called bhikkhunis but in the eyes of the um, of the people there they're given the same kind of respect as the monks are but to have a um, an opportunity a monastic vocation uh, for women and uh, i think is um, is something that should be supported just in what form it should take um, is is really the question um, yeah, because as you know, I mean, the monks, uh, monks can't, to be frank, the monks can't even run their own affairs very well, let alone to set up something for women. So, um, but the, on the other hand, of course, if a woman is interested in studying, practicing Buddhism, most good monasteries. Um, do have facilities for women to go and stay and practice long term and um, at least in my experience they have opportunity to meet with the teacher, to ask questions, to get uh, to receive teachings. So in terms of the, the practice side of things, if someone has a lot of faith and they want to study and practice Buddhism, um, I think women do have a, quite a good opportunity to do that. Um, it's just in the um, the, their ability to be able to become nuns, that um, there's still a problem. Okay, I have the next question. Um, what are your views on monks who do fortune telling? And does that have any contradictions with the Buddhist teachings? Well, um, it's monks are forbidden from telling fortunes by the uh, code of discipline. So um, it's, it's not to be done. Um, but in the, um, you know, as, as you probably know, for many hundreds of years, the monks who've lived in the village and city monasteries um, have adopted a much, um, let's say, more relaxed standard um, regarding the discipline and fortune-telling has um, been a tradition in Thai monasteries for a long time. And um, the monks who do it will sometimes say, well, you know, if you're just giving Dhamma talks, nobody comes. But if, they, if you um, 
do fortunes, they come and then you can get you have the opportunity to um, to teach them something useful. So it's kind of idea of fortune telling as a kind of a bait to draw people in. But, um, um, but fortune telling generally like looking at your your hand and so on, you know, um, line where if this is something, you know, so if someone's never um, meditated or followed any spiritual path, then um, fortune tellers can be quite accurate sometimes. But once you start meditating, then everything becomes fluid and um, they often won't even want to look at your hand anymore because um, if, you, if you're not meditating, you're very much kind of a prisoner of gum gao. Um, and your, your life tends to be conditioned by external things to a great degree. You know, your, your whole, your mood, your, your life, everything is so dependent on the people around you, on the situation and so on. And, and so um, your, your, your life is quite predictable in that way. Whereas once you start to meditate and, and your mind becomes clearer and brighter and um, then there's increased amount of wisdom and freedom in your life um, then your life becomes a lot more unpredictable in that way so it says in Buddhism what are the benefits of coming to meditation camp like this yeah. well um it's something that, you know, it's going to depend on, on you, isn't it, what, what you get out of it. I mean, this is really um, just a, a gathering um, for a couple of days. Um, it's not an intensive kind of meditation retreat. Um, but I, I hope that um, it can answer at least some of your basic questions about Buddhism, give you an understanding of the value of um, Buddhist teachings and the um, and, and perhaps some inspiration to continue um, to meditate and um, perhaps to go on to do uh, a fuller more uh, intensive kind of meditation uh, retreat for instance um, so this is um, you know, uh, introduction to, to Buddhism, Buddhist meditation for some of you who have um, been on retreats before or studied something before, maybe a bit of revision and just to clarify and go over some things that maybe you've learnt before but uh, you know, I also hope that um, you enjoy it basically um, number two how can we adapt the benefit of meditation to our daily life um, I think that um, as we're, we've gone beyond the, the time limit here, that I'll leave that one because it's, uh, I can talk um, quite a lot about that and, um, uh, you know, and what it means to integrate meditation into, into daily life and um, various methods of doing it and attitudes towards, towards it that uh, will be useful. Okay, so um, we, we'll have another question and answer session this afternoon. And um, I do invite everyone, you know, please, um, no need to feel green jai, and um, I'm not offended by any questions. I'm, I, I actually like critical questions or, or questions from people who don't agree with something. You don't have to all sort of pull the line and sort of be good Buddhists and, and just uh, I, I certainly don't want you just to believe things because I say them and I'm, I'm the authority figure here I mean I'm, uh, I understand my role is to encourage you to think and reflect and examine things for yourself um, because the ideal in Buddhism is to become your own refuge but before you can become your own refuge then you need good friend a good friend or good friends and people who can um, point, uh, point things out to you, clarify things, and um, apart from anything else, that saves time. Um, 
but uh, if you do any kind of question or just things you'd like to discuss and bring up and um, many of you know perhaps speaking with with Thai monks it's uh, you know it's a it's a little bit more difficult to talk about some things and and so one of uh, the advantages of uh, myself being born at least in in the west is a, perhaps a little bit more um, cosmopolitan and a little bit wide not I'm not saying deeper knowledge but a little wider knowledge and so it is a good opportunity to to discuss things that you're interested in learning about while you're here so we will have an, another um, session this afternoon where you can either write down questions or, or ask yourself whatever you would like to do okay so we'll finish for now and you can have your lunch